Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Angela Mackey, and I'm a pediatrician at Mayo Clinic Children's Center in Rochester, Minnesota. Today, we will be having a live discussion and question and answer session about the novel coronavirus infection that has caused an outbreak of respiratory disease and now has, ca has been detected in over 100 locations internationally, including the United States. Joining us for this discussion is Dr. Nipuni Rajapaksi, a pediatric infectious disease physician at Mayo Clinic Children's Center. Dr. Rajapaksi, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So well, there has been a lot of information about this new novel coronavirus, and some of it has been accurate, and some of it hasn't been accurate. And so I, our goal for today is really to make sure that we're putting out the latest information we have about this really fluid topic um, and trying to dispel some myths about this and hopefully help people feel more prepared about how to, how to go about their daily lives. Thanks. Yes, I completely agree. I think there's a lot of information that people are being presented with, and hopefully today we can help clarify some of those things they might be reading about. Absolutely. So let's get started by just having you help us understand what is the coronavirus and what is this? What is the COVID-19 that we keep hearing about? So coronaviruses are a family of viruses. Uh, there are now seven viruses that we know of that fall into that family. Uh, four of these viruses circulate commonly in the population. Right. They generally mm -hmm. cause symptoms of a common cold, so mm -hmm. some runny nose, sore throat, maybe a bit of cough. People recover from those on their own, usually without developing serious illness. There are three coronaviruses that we now know of that can cause more severe illness and infection in people. Uh, ones that people might be familiar with are the SARS coronavirus, mm -hmm. which was uh, detected in 2002 and led to an outbreak around the world, which affected about 8,000 people and about 800 people died uh, during that outbreak. There's also the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS coronavirus, uh, which was first detected in 2012, and we still see uh, cases of that occurring primarily in the Middle East. Uh, COVID-19 is caused by a novel or a new coronavirus, uh, which has been given the name of SARS coronavirus 2. Um, and this is a new infection that has been detected. It started in a city in China called Wuhan and has now spread to multiple areas around the world. This uh, virus, so all of the um, coronaviruses that can cause more severe illness, they are zoonotic viruses. What that means is they tend to start off in animals and then can make a jump to humans. This becomes a problem when you then have transmission from human to human, which is what we have seen now. So for example, with SARS, the animal that we think it came from was a, a civet cat. And with MERS, we suspect that camels are the source of that. For the novel uh, coronavirus that we're talking about today, um, we have not yet determined what that animal is, um, but the fact that this outbreak started or was centered around initially a live animal and seafood market suggests that, that um, some animal there was the source. Mm -hmm. So we, you mentioned the spread of, of this novel coronavirus, and it has spread really pretty rapidly over the past couple months. Um, do we know exactly how it is transmitted? So uh, COVID-19 disease is uh, spread through respiratory droplets. So what that means is if someone with the infection coughs or sneezes, they generate droplets. These are generally large droplets, so they can spread about three to six feet from the person that generates mm -hmm. them. So if you're within that range and someone coughs and sneezes, you are at risk of being infected. That's pretty close contact mm -hmm. that's required. Right. Um, kind of like we are exactly. right now. <laughs> yeah. um, if those droplets land mm -hmm. on a surface um, and you touch that surface and then you touch your eyes, nose, or mouth, mm -hmm. you are at risk of becoming infected as well. Um, there are some important, some important information about how this is not spread. So the virus is not spread uh, through intact skin. So just touching it will mm -hmm. not make you sick. The infection comes from touching your eyes, nose, or mouth when you have the virus on your hand. Um, it cannot spread through walls. So if you hear your neighbor on the other side of the wall coughing, that's not a direct uh, threat to you. Um, it's also, as I mentioned, close contact. Mm -hmm. So walking past someone in the street or in a public place mm -hmm. does not um, increase your risk of infection directly. And so I think it's important that people understand mm -hmm. that uh, those types of exposures are not uh, part of this. Um, really where we're seeing the most transmission occur mm -hmm. is in close contact. So within households, mm -hmm. when you're living closely with people, um, in healthcare settings, if healthcare providers aren't uh, wearing the proper personal protective mm -hmm. equipment when they're uh, caring for patients, those are the types of settings that we're seeing transmission occur. Um, one other thing is, can it live on, on hard surfaces? Um, and if someone touches that and then touches their eye or their face? Sure, that's a great mm -hmm. question. I think uh, for this specific virus, we're still learning the details okay. of that based on what we know about other similar viruses mm -hmm. and some of the preliminary information. Uh, we think it can survive on surfaces um, anywhere from a few hours to a few days, mm -hmm. but um, the exact 
numbers for this specific virus, people are still studying to determine that. Yeah, it's been interesting how rapidly the information about this has actually come out and has been published. Yeah, I think it. Um, there's still a lot of questions that we are looking to answer, but um, the amount of information that we've learned over mm-hmm. the last 10 weeks is really quite incredible. It, ha- it has been uh, a tribute to the, the science um, community. Mm-hmm. Um, so help me um, understand, how does this compare in how infectious it is compared to other kind of common illnesses that we know about, like measles and influenza? Great, I think that's also a fantastic question. So. Um, I think the final word we're still trying to determine Mm -hmm. on that. We probably won't know that for quite a while. Some of the preliminary um, estimates um, have ranged in the range of what we call an R0 or Mm -hmm. a number that reflects how many secondary cases an infected person uh, causes in a population that is susceptible Mm -hmm. to the infection um, have ranged mostly between two and four, so each infected person can infect two to four other people. Mm -hmm. But I suspect that number will change as the situation evolves. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the main reasons for that is because uh, we don't yet have uh, clear numbers on the people who have had very mild illness or infection, Mm -hmm. and those people who might not have presented to get testing because they were not that sick. And so as we learn those numbers, that number will change uh, to put that in perspective for other infections, so influenza, mm-hmm. the R0 is about 1.3, um, so lower than that. Mm-hmm. Um, measles, which people are probably quite familiar with given just last year we had multiple large outbreaks of measles around the country, is spread by a different route. So that is spread by airborne transmission, which means the measles virus particles can stay suspended in the air for prolonged periods of time. Um, that has an R0 of between 12 and 18, so on the more infectious side. Mm -hmm. But the way that measles is transmitted is very different Mm -hmm. than how this coronavirus is transmitted, and so we can't really directly compare the two. Okay. Do we know if asymptomatic people can spread the virus or can shed the virus um, and transmit it to other people? Yeah, so there's been a lot of interest Mm -hmm. in this question, um, and the initial studies that have come out suggest that this does take place. Okay. Um, this is not necessarily unique to this mm-hmm. infection for influenza, for example. Right. We know people can transmit for up to 24 hours before they develop mm-hmm. symptoms. Um, some of the studies, including some new ones that have come out just over the course of the last week, have shown that very early in illness, people seem to have high levels of virus in their secretion, and okay. that kind of also goes along with potentially them being able to transmit before they develop symptoms themselves. Um, that being said, uh, generally, the sense currently is that that is probably not what is driving mm-hmm. um, such fast spread, um, that most of the spread that we're seeing is coming from those people who have symptoms. And so that's why the initial focus to try and uh, mitigate spread or slow spread mm-hmm. has been focusing on those people with symptoms. Okay. There's been a lot of discussion um, in the media about the term community spread. Can you help us understand what that is and how it relates to how this disease is being transmitted? Yeah. So going back a few weeks ago, I'll just talk about the United States specifically. Mm -hmm. Um, Initially, all of the cases that we had here could be tied either to someone who had traveled abroad to an area where we knew an outbreak was happening, Mm -hmm. or they had been in close contact with someone who had traveled abroad. Um, When we talk about community spread, that refers to a person who um, does not have a travel history themselves and has not been in contact with anyone known to have uh, the infection. Um, And so that suggests that they likely picked up the infection somewhere in their own own community. And so that um, is kind of what is being used as a marker of whether there is kind of general illness in that community and the risk for people to be exposed there. Okay. Great. So let's get into talking about some of the symptoms, and we have some excellent questions coming through. So I want to thank everyone who has been sending in questions. We will try our best to get to (laughs) all of them. And um, throughout the broadcast, we may not actually say that this was your question, but I'm seeing many questions come through. So what are the symptoms that people should look for, Um, and so when they should start to be concerned? So the main symptoms that have been reported in some of the large uh, scientific papers that have come out have been uh, fever, cough and shortness of breath. Uh, Many people have also reported kind of muscle aches and pains or feeling more tired. Mm -hmm. Um, It seems like a minority of people um, have what we refer to as upper respiratory tract symptoms. Mm -hmm. So runny nose, sore throat, those have been reported but don't seem to be amongst the most common symptoms. And uh, some people, the most recent article that I read has been less than 5%, so not very common, Mm -hmm. have had uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, so things like abdominal pain, nausea, diarrhea. 
Okay. Um, how long does it take for these symptoms to manifest after a person may have been exposed? So that question gets to the incubation period mm-hmm. of the virus. So that's the time from when you are exposed to when you start to develop mm-hmm. symptoms. Uh, currently, the infect- incubation period is 2 to 14 days. And so we would expect if you were exposed, you would develop symptoms during that period of time. Yeah. Um, how um, Are there certain populations of people that are going to be more vulnerable, and should they be taking extra precautions? So that's a great question, I think very relevant to this uh, Mm -hmm. infection. Um, We have some large now series of patients that have been reported in the literature, and that has shown us, and through the experiences in some of the other countries that have had um, large outbreaks, we know that uh, people, older adults, seem to be at higher risk Mm -hmm. for having more severe um, illness. Um, People who have underlying medical conditions, so things like heart disease, underlying lung disease, uh, diabetes, um, people who are on medications that might suppress their immune system, Mm -hmm. um, those people also seem to be at higher risk of developing more serious illness. Um, In these series of patients that have been reported, it is uh, helpful and I think somewhat reassuring to know that about 80% of people who became infected had mild illness. And so I think that's really important Mm -hmm. information to people for people to be aware of. Most people that get this infection do have mild illness, especially if they're younger or otherwise healthy. More like cold symptoms. Exactly, yeah. Okay. So cold symptoms, uh, maybe a bit of cough um, that goes mm-hmm. away on its own, usually over the course of a week or two. Okay, we have a great audience question about how would we be able to differentiate this from an influenza infection versus this novel coronavirus infection? So that's a great question. We are obviously still in the midst of uh, influenza season here in the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, the symptoms of both are pretty indistinguishable. So you can't look at someone and tell if they have influenza or uh, COVID-19. That differentiation really comes from testing Mm -hmm. for the virus itself. Okay. How about, um, there's been a lot of talk about the death rate um, and and a lot of research that's gone to try to determine what that might be with this illness. Do we know that yet or is it still an evolving picture? So definitely still an evolving picture. It's important to recognize that uh, because testing is not yet very widely available, Mm -hmm. most of the tests and confirmed cases have been in patients who are admitted to hospital. It seems to be where people have mostly Mm -hmm. focused on testing. And Mm -hmm. so um, that means that you're already testing a group of people who are probably more sick Mm -hmm. uh, than the general population and people who are out in the community. Um, Based on, there's been a lot of kind of estimates that have been thrown out there. We do know the mortality rate depends on your age Mm -hmm. quite significantly with people over the age of 80 being at highest risk of um, dying, up to 15% in one of the cases uh, series that was published. Um, But I think we will need a lot more information before we have an accurate um, kind of mortality rate from, from this outbreak. Do we know how it affects children? So um, we have uh, now have sub- some information mm-hmm. on how kids are affected, and thankfully the initial information seems to be quite reassuring. Okay. So um, healthy kids uh, in the most recent large series, they made up about 2% of the cases reported, so mm-hmm. a small proportion of those um, that have been reported, and uh, they generally have mild illness, if any symptoms at all. Uh, Most kids have been identified because they were tested as part of a family group or cluster, Mm -hmm. and some of those kids haven't had any symptoms at all, even though they may have tested positive. So um, I think the news for healthy kids is Mm -hmm. pretty reassuring so far. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we're early in the course of this, so Mm -hmm. more information will come out, but thus far, they seem to be mildly affected. Mm -hmm. Um, We do know that kids... Um, do shed virus in their secretions, okay. Question, there you go. <laughs> and so they can be um, a factor, important factor yes. in the transmission of, of disease, even though they might right. not get very sick right. themselves. And so that's kind of an important consideration mm-hmm. when we look at measures to try and slow the spread. Okay, and probably some of the measures that where we're seeing some of the schools closing, is that come is that coming into play because of that? Yeah. So okay. in. Uh, prior bad influenza outbreaks or other Mm -hmm. respiratory uh, disease outbreaks where kids seem to play an important role in transmission. Some measures like Mm -hmm. closing schools have been helpful in slowing down the spread. And so as the situation evolves, we may Mm -hmm. see that happen in different parts of the country. Okay. A couple more audience questions. What do we know about how uh, this affects pregnant women and their infants? Yeah, so another very important question, Um, and we have some kind of early information. Um, There was a series of nine pregnant patients that was reported in the medical literature, and I think the results overall from that were pretty reassuring. So they tested a bunch of, uh, so the amniotic fluid, cord blood, and breast milk uh, from these 
uh, patients who had COVID towards the end of their mm -hmm. pregnancies, and they were not able to detect the virus in those fluids. Mm -hmm. And then they tested the babies after they were born, and they all tested negative. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of initial reassuring information mm -hmm. and fits with what we know about most respiratory viruses, um, that vertical transmission or transmission from pregnant mom to baby mm -hmm. uh, doesn't occur. Mm -hmm. um, we will learn more about this as things evolve in okay. the future. What about pregnant women? Are they among the group that people that may be more highly affected? So um, I think based on what we know about other respiratory viruses, mm -hmm. I would put them in that group okay. for now. We're still kind of learning mm -hmm. exactly how this virus behaves in pregnant women. Um, but we do know that pregnancy is a time of relative immune suppression or weakening of the immune system. Mm -hmm. And so I think they uh, should be kind of treated as part of that, that group until we learn more. Okay. Let's move on to what to do should you develop symptoms or suspect that you may have contracted some coronavirus uh, symptoms, what should people, what precautions should they be taking? So I think the very first thing to really emphasize is that um, if you are sick, you should stay home mm -hmm. unless you are seeking medical care. Um, we are, we suspect that there will be uh, transmission within the community and we want to do what we can. I think it's everyone's responsibility mm -hmm. to try and do what we can to not overwhelm our mm -hmm. healthcare system. And so definitely uh, stay home unless you're going out to get medical care. Um, you should try and separate yourself from people and animals in your home. So as I mentioned earlier, um, spread occurs amongst close contacts. And so those would be the people at higher risk for getting sick from you if you yourself are unwell. If you decide that you uh, do need to get care for your illness, uh, you should call ahead before you visit your doctor mm -hmm. or enter a healthcare facility. Yes. Um, and uh, you will be advised to wear a mask before you enter any mm -hmm. of those, those facilities to help prevent transmission of the infection to other people. Um, your doctor will also be the best person to work with your uh, local public health officials to determine what your risk is for having this infection and whether you qualify for testing. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's important that you let them know um, so that you know where to go if they do decide that you should be tested for this. Um, other things in terms of pre preventing transmission to other people is to practice what we call respiratory etiquette. So covering your coughs and mm -hmm. sneezes, um, either coughing or sneezing into your elbow or into a tissue and washing your hands really well after that. Um, what, hand washing frequently is really one of the best ways to prevent transmission and something that we are encouraging everyone to do. I think everyone should get into the habit of washing their hands as one of the first things they do when they enter their homes, yes. uh, try and keep the home kind of a clean right. and mm -hmm. uh, protected space. Um, and then they have also advised cleaning high touch surfaces. So these are things mm -hmm. like um, faucets, tabletops, doorknobs, light switches, things that you touch frequently um, on a daily basis to prevent transmission through those, those objects. Uh, monitor your sy symptoms closely. Mm -hmm. um, most people who just have a cold don't need to go in and see a doctor for that. Um, kind of worrisome symptoms to look out for obviously are things like uh, difficulty breathing, um, dehydration if you're not able to drink fluids, chest pain, those types of things mm -hmm. would be reasons to seek medical care. Um, and But it's important to kind of be in contact with your healthcare provider um, regarding your specific situation. And again, if you are going in to be evaluated, um, always helpful to inform them prior mm -hmm. that you're coming in so that the appropriate precautions can be taken to protect other people mm -hmm. that might be around. Absolutely. I can't stress that enough, especially where we're at at this point in the situation. I know it's fluid and it's changing, mm -hmm. but um, at, at this point there may be certain locations they may direct you to as opposed to other clinics or, or settings. Yeah, so. I think it's important to recognize that, um, firstly, not everyone will need to be tested. Mm -hmm. It depends on where you live, mm -hmm. what your risk is for exposure. Mm -hmm. um, and also, uh, as of now, testing is only available in certain places, so you don't want to show up to the mm -hmm. wrong place if they can't test you. So that's why it's really important to communicate with your healthcare providers so that they can guide you to the appropriate mm -hmm. places to go um, mm -hmm. in your community if mm -hmm. you need to be seen. Yeah, we're having lots of questions coming in about testing. Mm -hmm. How do we know who should be tested? So uh, the recommendations regarding who should be tested mm -hmm. are uh, evolving mm -hmm. as we see spread occur in different areas of the country. Right. Um, and so the best place to get that information is through your healthcare provider or um, on your local state public health website. Mm -hmm. They may provide some guidance for who qualifies for testing in your um, specific area. In terms of general principles, people who have compatible symptoms, so fever, cough, shortness of breath, and uh, in many areas now uh, still some risk of exposure, so either travel um, or exposure to a known case would qualify you for testing. But again, that information will probably change in the coming weeks.
Okay. And exactly how do we test? What does it look like at yeah. this point? So um, the test that we're using is something called a PCR, polymerase chain okay. reaction test. Mm -hmm. This directly detects uh, some of the genetic material from the virus. Um, the best samples or the recommended samples right now to run that testing on are a nasopharyngeal swabs. It's like a Q-tip that takes a swab of the back of your nose and throat. Really fun. Yeah. <laughs> or a uh, throat swab. Those seem mm -hmm. to be able to pick up the virus when okay. it is there in the upper respiratory tract, and so those are the recommended mm -hmm. samples at the current time. Okay. Let's talk about treatments. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, have a, I even had family members asking about if antibiotics would be helpful for this. Can you talk about what we know about treating it and yeah. if there is a medication available? Great. So antibiotics only work against bacteria. This mm -hmm. illness is caused by a virus, so antibiotics will not be um, right. effective. Um, there are uh, quite a few uh, candidate drugs that are being tested now mm -hmm. to see, one, whether they work, and two, what side effects or complications we might expect to see if, if and when we use them. These are being studied in kind of very controlled settings, what we would call a clinical trial, mm -hmm. in multiple different areas around the world. Um, so there are some things that have been found to be maybe effective in animal studies before mm -hmm. or in vitro or in the lab seem to have activity against the virus. Mm -hmm. And so those are now being tested to see whether they are effective. I think last I heard there was over 100 different clinical trials already underway. So the response from the scientific community to this has been quite quite impressive. Yeah, it's been very it takes time to get the results from these right. studies back though. And so um, over time we will learn whether any of these are, are effective. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Let's move on to talking about what people can do to pr protect themselves. I think there's a lot of fear yeah. about this, um, and we're seeing a lot of supplies for things like masks and other personal protective equipment being scarce. Right. So let's talk about that. Yeah. So um, I think it's important for people to recognize that uh, we do have some control over this. There mm -hmm. are certain things that you can start doing now that are helpful, and certain things that people have been doing that are not not helpful and so try and provide some guidance on what you should be doing um, in terms of supplies so we know masks the general public does not need to wear a mask unless they themselves are sick with symptoms the masks only help with uh, preventing transmission to other people if you are sick um, wearing a mask when you're out and about in the community is not going to be helpful if you're you're healthy and also takes away resources from healthcare system that is really depending on these to um, protect uh, people in healthcare facilities. And take care of patients that get sick. Exactly, mm -hmm. for healthcare workers who will be in very close contact with people who, who are sick. Um, we do recommend uh, that people should prepare themselves, prepare their family, so that involves things like making sure you have about two weeks worth of food available at home in case you get sick and you aren't able to go out to the grocery store or should not go out to the grocery mm -hmm. store because you risk transmitting infection to others. Um, that's A two-week supply is adequate. Um, we're not encouraging people to hoard or buy copious quantities of food, um, but a two-week supply is reasonable to have on hand at home. Uh, make sure you have some cleaning supplies at home. Again, a reasonable amount to last for a few weeks to help with cleaning those high touch surfaces if you do become unwell. Uh, make sure you have some supply of any prescription medications that you take that can last you um, for a couple of months, two, mm -hmm. three months would even be, be reasonable to avoid making unnecessary trips out to the pharmacy or other places like that um, during this period. That might vary depending on what medications you are and how stable they are, but mm -hmm. I think is a reasonable thing for people to do. And I think we should uh, talk to our families, talk to our neighbors, talk to our people in our community who might um, struggle a bit more mm -hmm. if they come down with this illness. Yeah. So Check elderly people. members, mm -hmm. keep an eye out for the people around you and try and help out where you can um, with them. Um, I think those are the things that people should focus on doing mm -hmm. now and uh, will prove helpful in the coming weeks. So we know that people are not very good at washing hands in mm. general. What is the correct way to wash hands? Yeah. And is sanit hand sanitizer adequate? Um, or if you have an option for both, which would you pick? Sounds good. So um, one thing I didn't mention when we were talking about the virus specifically is this virus has what we call an envelope around it. That makes it um, quite susceptible to hand sanitizer, alcohol-based hand rub. So both are a good option. The mm -hmm. important thing is really to just do it. Yeah. Wash your hands and wash your hands frequently. Right. Um, the situations where we recommend uh, specifically soap and water are if your hands are visibly dirty. Mm -hmm. So if they're greasy or they have dirt or something on them, um, definitely soap and water is preferable in that situation. Um, the proper way to do it with soap and water is uh, 20 seconds. Uh, so the time it takes to sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star or Happy Birthday twice will get you to about 20 seconds. 
to use soap, lather all the surfaces of your hands. We know that people miss common areas, so the backs of the hands in between your fingers and your fingertips are the most commonly mm-hmm. missed areas, so making sure to focus on those um, and then to rinse your hands off with cool running water. Using very hot water is not recommended. Mm-hmm. It can be dangerous in terms of causing burns and it doesn't make your hand washing more successful. Mm-hmm. Um, so using just a comfortable t- water temperature is what we recommend. Okay. Alcohol-based hand rub, um, as I mentioned, is effective uh, against this virus. Um, the important thing with alcohol-based hand rub is to use enough that your hands stay wet for at least 20 seconds. Mm-hmm. Um, if five, 10 seconds into it, your hands are completely dry, you need to take another okay. squirt and um, keep going because the longer the time of contact, the better, more effective it okay. is. Okay, so apply very liberally. Yes. And- Rub all over the right surfaces right. of your hands. Sounds good. Um, so I, I'm still seeing some um, questions and um, concerns about transmission sure. um, from questions that are coming in. Um, people are concerned that it can live in the air if you walk through an area where people may have just recently coughed. Mm-hmm. Um, can you just kind of go over again the transmission just sure. to clarify it for people? So the transmission is yeah. by droplet spread. These are large respiratory droplets, mm-hmm. so they're pretty heavy. Mm-hmm. Um, they spread within three to six feet of the person that generates them. They don't linger or hang out in the air. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're within that range of someone who coughs and sneezes, yes, you're at risk of being exposed. Mm -hmm. But if you're outside of that range, it's not. not And if they've already walked through and they've been gone for 10, 15 minutes, it's not necessarily a concern. Exactly. Yeah. So that's not a concern. Do we know how long it can live on surfaces um, if you were to touch it and and put it in your eyes and whatnot? So the best kind of current estimates are it can live for a few hours to a few days. Uh, Some of the studies have suggested up to nine days but I think for this specific virus we're still learning that exact fact about it okay do we have a vaccine and is there research going on Mm -hmm. to try and create a vaccine yeah so we do not have a a vaccine Mm -hmm. yet but there are multiple groups around the world that are working on it um, and actually have been able to make quite rapid progress that being said we don't expect that a vaccine would be available Mm -hmm. any sooner than a year really best case scenario but Mm -hmm. likely it'll take longer than that Mm -hmm. but what do we have a vaccine for that is also circulating in the community so we do have influenza (laughs) vaccine um, and as we talked about Mm -hmm. the symptoms for Mm COVID-19 and influenza can be exactly the same. And we know in some years the flu season has gone as late as May. Mm -hmm. And so we are still encouraging people to get their flu vaccine um, because it, for one, causes increased burden on our healthcare system if we still have a lot of patients with flu that we have to take care of on Mm -hmm. top of this. Um, And also it causes some complications if you have influenza. You may have to go through the testing for COVID-19 and Mm -hmm. other other things, be quarantined, et cetera. And so we really are still recommending people get the flu vaccine. Anyone over six months of age um, is eligible to receive it um, and they can still get it. It's not too late. Fantastic. Um, A couple other questions that have come in. Should people be worried about transmitting this to their animals and pets? So it's a a good question. I think the information on that is uh, still evolving. There have been uh, some cases where the virus has been detected Mm -hmm. in a a pet, Mm -hmm. um, but there have been no confirmed cases where the pet has transmitted it to someone else. Um, The general recommendations if you are uh, quarantined at home is to avoid contact with people and animals for Mm -hmm. that reason. Mm -hmm. Um, But thus far, there's no signs that pets are transmitting it to humans or that pets are necessarily getting sick from it themselves. Okay. A a lot of questions um, that I've had coming into my office are Mm -hmm. concerning travel. Spring break is coming up, Mm -hmm. holidays are coming up, and people have travel plans. What what recommendations would you give to families about upcoming travel? So I think this is a big question. I've Mm -hmm. been getting a lot of messages from people as well about this. Um, Really, the Things are evolving in such a way that the CDC website is the best place to get specific travel advice and information, and they are updating that on an ongoing basis. And so I think that's really where people should be looking to see what is going on in the area that they were planning to travel to. Um, They also need to think about their own risks Mm -hmm. related to uh, this infection. So um, older adults, people who have underlying medical Mm -hmm. conditions, um, I think the travel recommendations for them have been a bit more more strict because they're Mm -hmm. at higher risk for having more serious Mm -hmm. illness. And so I think there's a lot of different factors to take into consideration in deciding whether to travel or not at this time. Mm -hmm. And Mayo is is coming up with new travel recommendations for their employees as well at this point. So Exactly, yeah. So I think these uh, recommendations, you have seen some evolution in what has been Mm -hmm. recommended over the last few weeks. I think restricting travel of people is not something we want to do unless we really think it will help protect them or our patients. Mm -hmm. Um, And so those 
uh, recommendations will have evolved already and yes. will likely continue to yeah. evolve in the coming weeks. Yeah. As we prepared for this talk, things changed even overnight about the number of locations internationally where that have been identified. Yeah. So um, it, it is definitely a fluid situation. Um, what, um, what would you say to families as we kind of get close to the end of our time about how to talk to this illness up, um, with their young children? Yeah. So I, they're hearing about it. We were exactly. talking about this before. You know, they're hearing about the playgrounds and other things. Yeah. So I think um, kids seem to be very aware of what, what is going on. Even mm-hmm. in our clinic, we've had kids asking uh, <laughs> questions of us as well. And I think it's important to talk to them about it because mm-hmm. they are hearing about it. Mm-hmm. I think they really pick up on how the adults around them are mm-hmm. behaving and treating it. So I think trying to remain calm. Um, um, and address any questions they have is important. If you don't know the answer, CDC website has a lot of great information yes. and really covers yeah. a lot of these common questions. So you can go there with them to try and look up the answers. Um, I think we have to be honest with kids mm-hmm. about what is going on, but also reassuring in that there's a lot of people that are working around the country, around the world, to mm-hmm. help slow the spread of this infection. And for kids specifically, um, again, the information that we have so far is quite reassuring that mm-hmm. it might cause kind of cold flu type symptoms, but most kids might not have any symptoms at all um, and haven't been shown to be a group that has very severe illness. And so I think it's just important to uh, truthfully answer their their questions Mm -hmm. um, that they have and um, keep them kind of updated in an uh, age-specific way. And we just showed um, two different websites for resources for, for families and, and people to go to. Can you repeat those again for people? Yeah, so the CDC website has a lot of really great information that is being updated multiple times a day mm-hmm. um, and is a great place for the general public to get information if they have questions. Uh, the World Health Organization website also has some really uh, excellent information on it as well. Um, there's been a lot of spread of information um, about this outbreak and there's a lot of misinformation mm-hmm. out there, so I would really encourage people look at these kind of validated mm-hmm. sources. Your local Mm-hmm. state um, public health website probably mm-hmm. has um, specific information about your area as mm-hmm. well so that's another good place to look but I would be um, very careful about what you're you're reading and mm-hmm. especially what you're spreading sharing mm-hmm. on social media making sure it comes from some validated mm-hmm. sources absolutely and especially some of the things you may see of ways to treat the illness as we've seen in other countries yeah. uh, making sure that before you try something you talk to your physician about it yeah I yeah. completely agree yeah absolutely well thank you so much for joining us we uh, did rapid fire questions with you mm-hmm. and you did fantastic okay. um, this this has been invaluable, I think, to everyone to get accurate information, especially from a pediatric infectious disease doctor. So thank thank you you so much for for joining us. And thank you everyone who sent in questions. If we didn't have a chance to get to them, we will try to answer them after the live broadcast. Remember to check the CDC website and your local health department for ongoing updates about this fluid situation in the coming weeks. Have a wonderful day. And remember, it's not too late to get your flu vaccination.